me. I'm Ron Funches, and we're all working on getting better. Hi, guys. It's me, Ron Funches. Thank you for listening. Getting better. It's my favorite podcast. If it's even in your top five, I'm excited about that. Top 20. I don't care. As long as you listen to it. Hope you're having a great day. Hope you're feeling strong. Hope you're feeling smart, confident. Even if you're not, just know you can get past those things and that you are a wonderful person. And we all feel down sometimes. We all feel unconfident. We all have doubt in our lives, but you can still get through it and you'll be stronger on the other end. I know I did today. I was out doing some voiceovers for a movie today that I booked a year ago that I forgot about. And then when I went in today, I was working with Danny DeVito. Isn't that crazy? He's very intimidating for a man who's very small. Uh, and so I freaked out a little bit. And I was just like, oh, but this is where I always want to be. The, the and more, where people don't know me. And I can go out and I can prove myself and prove what I'm worth. And, and show my comedic chops and show that I'm funny and good at voice acting. And I hope I did. Um, hope they don't replace me. We'll see. But either if, even if they do... You guys are hearing it. that I did a scene with Danny DeVito. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> and you don't have to do that to, to, to feel good about yourself. I just hope you're feeling confident. Hope you're working out in whatever fashion. Are you going to the gym? Are you just doing videos off of YouTube like Fitness Blender or whatever? That's what me and Robot do sometimes when I don't have... Um, gym days with, with Jorgen. I just do a little flip fitness blender with her and, and some things I can't even like my knees get, get a little weird. Sometimes my joints get weird. Her her she has some problems with some her foot and her joints. And so we just adjust our workout and we don't push it too hard, but we're just staying active. And that's what we're trying to do in our getting better lifestyle. Stay active. Stay pushing towards something. Stay going forward. Not let resting on our laurels. Not just uh hanging back and, and just letting things come to us, you know. We push for things little by little, even if we're, you know, small progress is still progress, you know. So even if you're just taking a step, you're still moving forward. And that's all we try to do because life is long, progress is slow, you know. I've been um, seeing doing other podcasts. I did the About Last Night podcast. Uh, that probably is out by the time you're listening to this with Adam Ray and Brad Williams. And uh, that was fun to see them. They're just guys who I've known for a few years and just um, – if there's any positive since since uh, Brody Stevens passed is that um, I think everybody is becoming more aware of that that time is finite and that we all will go at some point and nothing is constant and and we're all trying to spend more time with each other and be um, a little more present with each other and that's that feels good um, and I just want to do that in all aspects of my life with my son uh, with robot with my mom. You know, I just want to be grateful that I have them. I don't want don't want to take them for granted because n nothing in this life is constant. This too shall pass, as they say. Um, so I don't really have much of an intro for you today because this is an episode we're recording. We're, ooh, I can't even say words. <laughs> this is an episode we're recording the day after the episode we did with Griffin Newman, which I hope you enjoyed. I enjoyed it very much. I did not know that young man very much. And um, just hearing him talk and, and I was very, um, I became an even bigger fan. I was already a fan of his work and I'm a bigger fan of his work and I'm a bigger fan of him as a person. So. I loved it, but but since we are recording the day after, and we normally do a topical weekend review up front, I don't got much. We're gonna have to do. We're gonna reach into our mailbag, and Halston is gonna pick out some emails that we got from Getting Better Pod at Gmail dot com, and I'm gonna answer them. So. All right. Looks like we got one from Zachary. I like that you're slightly off camera. For this. No, I'm not on camera at all. <laughs> I don't need to be on camera. Well, you're on mic, but off camera. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that life. Uh, dear Ron, long time listener, first time emailer. I've always loved your comedy, but the Getting Better podcast has encouraged me more than expected. After losing 80 pounds myself, I actually fell off my routine, dipping, get, dipping back into the old habits of eating lots of fast food. Not only do I want to do better for myself, your achievements help me to realize that we are in control of our health and anything is possible. 
The real reason I'm e- emailing you, though, is because I s- similarly find myself absorbing stand-up as if that's something I want to do with my life. Hmm. I know that because of your son, you had a we-have-to-make-it mentality, but do you have any advice for someone just trying to get up on stage for the first time? I can't seem to shake the this doesn't feel like a real job stage yet. I don't know what to call it. There's something inside me telling me at least I need to try. Well, first of all, congratulations. Um, congratulations on the weight loss that you did achieve, and I'm glad that I'm helping you in any way. Thank you very much. That makes me very happy. Um, I hope that you're back on, on focusing on your diet and staying away from the fast food because that's not good for anybody. That's not even quality. When we cut out some of those fast food trips and save up that, that money for the week and then get, get a good, good meal by the end of the week, go get yourself something nice. Treat yourself as a star that you are, you know? And, you know, just just don't don't do that. That's just trash. This is there to poison us so that at the end of the day, we're reliant on, on drugs and stuff so that we can just even stay alive. You know, you guys take control of your health while, while you can. But as far as the stand up. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a time if you've asked me that question when I was in my 20s where I would have said, like, oh, if you don't have to do stand up, don't do it. You know, like it's just calling. And if you're not called to it, don't do it. But I feel like like any art form, like any craft, there, there's levels to everything. Like I tried wrestling because I wanted to try it because it's the thing that I love. And I wanted to go and, 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 and see what it felt like to be inside the ring. And what I found out was that I was not naturally, I was not naturally inclined at it, wasn't good at it. Um, but I put in the effort and I tried and I could do it for a little bit. But I knew at the end of the day, I wasn't going to be a professional wrestler, but I wanted to be courteous. I wanted to be um, not be in people's way, I wanted to be on time. And I wanted to show up and do um, do the job. And I think that's, that's all I would say to you is that if you want to, do it just get up there and do it don't you don't have to lose your job if you have a regular job then don't worry about whether it feels like a real job you already got a job this is your your passion you can have a job and a passion you can have outside activities and hobbies and then this one i would think would be very productive for you you might meet some new friends um you get a deeper appreciation for comedy that's for sure because as soon as you go up and you bomb you have a complete deeper appreciation for comedy so and that will happen <laughs> i promise you i promise you you're going to bomb uh, <laughs> but why not just go up and, and, and try it if you have jokes you want to try life as again we're learning from 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 our friends whether it be will or brody or 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 kevin barnett or anyone that life is short it's finite and if this is something you want to do you might as well try it because you i assume you got the time (laughs) we all got the time there's all open mics around our areas that we could go try out um and just know it's not that big of a deal you know even if you really want to do it and you love it you you go and do it you find out and you love it you're probably from this moment seven to ten years away from it being a profitable endeavor for you so you might as well get started now if you want to do it and um and you if it sucks you don't like it quit that's my advice for everything if you don't enjoy it stop doing it that's awesome I got a lot of this this question. There were a lot of these questions. I'm enjoying your podcast and want the ability to sing along with your theme song accurately. What are the lyrics? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. Do you want me to play it? Yeah, play the song. It's Ron singing. I gotta find it. Dead air. Great for podcasts. Okay, that's the end of it. Okay, that's the we could start it a little earlier. Brody. Yes. You got your health and your wealth, but don't forget your spiritual life. It's about being good friends and good sex and doing the best that you can. I mean, it's, it seems clear as day to me. Getting better. <laughs> and getting, getting better together, together with me. Yeah. 
That's it. You got it now. I think you got it. Think was health and your wealth. But don't forget your spiritual life. It's about being good friends. And I think I say good sex. I'm not sure even there. That's the point where I forget. <laughs> uh, but it's definitely about friendship and relationships and sex. Let's play that part again. Yeah. Maybe we'll know. We'll find out. <laughs> yes. Don't forget your spirit, your life. Oh, it's about having good sex and being a good friend. I thought that it said it's about having basics, like a no. core foundation. I thought it was about having basics. No. That's awesome. Yeah, great sex. You snuck that one in there. Yeah. This one's from Connor. I was wondering how you prioritize how you improve yourself or have any advice for how I can. Sometimes I sit down to make a huge list of all the things I want to change or improve or get better at. It ends up being a pretty big daunting task. Yeah, exactly. Knowing that there are so many things I want to improve makes it daunting to work on them, especially when I slip up. The list is anything from improving health, getting into better eating habits, budgeting better, being more positive, all over the place. So I guess my question is this. How do you pick what you improve when you're constantly getting better? Is it a conscious decision you make or do you pay more attention to the overall mental framework you have? It's a little bit of both. That's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think I, I look at it uh, like a basketball player, a great basketball player. Like um, They might be come in and they're good at certain things and they just keep working at their game, but then sometimes they'll they'll pick certain aspects of the game like if you're a perimeter player you're not good in the post if you're not good down low you might then be like oh i need to learn some post moves because i'm getting older i'm losing my athleticism so it's a little bit like that but you don't you don't stop working on your three pointers you know so it's like you're still working on like let's say your list like being positive being more positive that's the thing that you can work on every day constantly all the time whereas your health goal is, is something that you're going to have to see step by step a little bit over a little and then to me that can be um just making your goals more specific and if your goal is like oh i want to get healthier then i think the one step that you can make from the start is like oh what can i cut out you know so i would pick one thing i can cut out whether if you're a heavy soda drinker a heavy candy eater um heavy fast food person or, or cheese guy or whatever and just if you were two if you have two or three of those on your list like i know i did um you know pick the one that you go okay this is the because for me i was like okay um i love soda i love gummies um i could quit soda easier than i can quit gummies i don't did have you gummies eat them both much. together oh yeah that's a good mix no, the gummies get so hard no you're being ridiculous gummies you take a gum and you chew it up a little bit and you swig a little soda in in there you double sugar blast you're on the moon basically do you have cavities no what yeah come on man <laughs> and so you know just pick a thing and just be more specific about what your goals are because i think that can be daunting if your goals are in general like be healthier be more positive that's a very daunting goal on its own you got to break it down do do some short-term goals in there what can i do if i want to like if i want to just and, and don't make it like um goal based so don't make it like oh i need to lose five pounds the next month make it be like oh i'm gonna go um i never go walking so I'm going to go walking two times this week. I'm going to go walking three times this week. I'm going to go try walking every day after work and just build it up, build it up. And then that, because of that, the, the pounds and, and the side effects from being healthier will occur. You know, you don't want to go into it just thinking about weight loss because a lot of times, especially if you have been sedentary like I was, um, the weight loss comes in conjunction with muscle mass. So then you might work out a bit be feeling healthier be looking better but actually go up a couple pounds you know so you can't worry about that you just get through so i guess my advice is you is break it down into steps be a little bit more specific have short term medium term long term goals and, and, and just also you know know you're human give yourself a break know you can rest know you're going to make mistakes and that doesn't mean the effort is all we need from you really you know you know everything else you'll, you'll figure out with experience but as long as you're making that effort and having that commitment you'll be just fine this one is 
uh more of a story but also it's got a cool mantra at the end that that he kind of made up because of this podcast this is from tom over the last few years over the last few years my life has had its ups and downs i've dealt with depression trauma from a past abusive toxic relationship and loss i am proud of myself for getting away from such negatives in my life but i do struggle with the residual weight of my past decisions last week on your podcast after listening to you share your story, your struggles, and your vision for a better today and better future, it inspired me. It really did. I went to work the next day and was faced with a challenge, a trigger that took me back to a very heavy place. I stood there and stared into the distance and drew a very long breath. I thought about the inspiration I got from your podcast and decided not to take myself back down the path into that negative thought. After that, I was calm, to which I told myself in my best Ron Funches voice, I'm getting better. It acted like a form of cognitive behavioral therap- therapy, which I have learned but struggled applying in the past. Oh, it's pretty cool, that right? That's very cool. That makes me very happy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm glad. Yeah, because that that's it, right? There is no. It's not. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you always make the right choice. But it means that you know you can look at the mistakes you've made in the past and go i don't want to do those again i don't i'm i'm getting better i'm not that guy anymore i don't mean i'm a perfect guy but i'm a better person and that that's really all it's about um that actually reminds me of a um a dm i got on instagram from a guy who said that um he listened to the podcast and he he liked the advice about just focusing on yourself and not looking on other people's paper and and not and that he had a coworker that he just really didn't enjoy and didn't like and they were kind of going at each other all the time and that he took that advice and just stopped engaging with that coworker and started just focusing on his work and then three months later he had a promotion and was making more money and it was out of that area that's awesome right that's a beautiful story i'm glad man you guys make me so happy that i do this uh unprofitable podcast <laughs> for now <laughs> <laughs> this one's from farron my dream in life is to have a cartoon and i've been given an opportunity of a lifetime but i've had the worst writer's block and i was wondering what gets you out of those kind of funks oh for his writer's block yeah Mm. especially under pressure yeah under pressure that makes it difficult and i think that that can be a, really a self-made block right there right like i think the thing you always gotta remind yourself is that you do it for fun anyway so why this doesn't make it different there might be a deadline or something of that nature but you this is what you do for fun and this is what you want to do and this is what your mind naturally creates so if anything i would um I would stop for a little bit. I stop for maybe a couple of days and just go go see some movies. Go go to the park. Um, if you're the type of person that does mushrooms, I would go do some mushrooms and I would um, just let the world inspire me again. And instead of me being so focused on, I mean, I'm I'm giving this advice to myself right now, trying to move on from my special into new material, is to just relax. Material comes because you're. This is just what you do. This is your life, and this is. And that doesn't mean you. You know, I still have to write. I still have to get up and put the effort in. But um, just don't put the pressure on yourself. Really, I know that's hard to say. But um, again, this is your opportunity. I think one of the main things that someone told me one time, um, and this might help you, and I hope it does. Maybe it won't. But um, don't think about, don't think uh, about this as something that you're achieving. Um, just think about all the people who told you you could never have that. You know, it shifts your, it's kind of that kind of shifts your mind. It goes from being like, oh, I'm happy to be here, and oh, I better achieve this and doing that, and it goes from like, oh yeah this person said i couldn't do this well fuck you i'm gonna show you i can you know i did that for my first uh conan tape and uh, i don't remember who gave me the advice but it was a comedian and it was excellent advice because it really shifted me from being just like oh i'm happy to be here and i hope they like me to going like going in my head going specific people going okay my ex-wife's mom okay this person okay my sociology teacher who saw me three years after i got out of high school and asked me um i guess i guess it must have been eight years after i got out of high school asked me what i was doing and i told them i was a comedian and they were like yeah but what do you do for money you know it's like okay you can go in and find specific instances and go like this is the moment i'm showing them that they're wrong and you can do that w- with, with with what you're doing you know and just and hopefully that kind of 
tweaks your brain a little bit from being overwhelmed to going back into being like uh predatory and being like we, we can we can crush this that's how i feel about it that might not be good advice <laughs> there's also a fantastic book called the artist's way mm. oh yeah and it's kind of a workshop as well and you got to do the whole thing but one of the cool things that i got from that book was um, taking yourself on artist dates, whether that be to the beach or go do something that you've never done before mm -hmm. or, or, you know, what I did was I went to go paint some pottery or whatever and it's just totally opposite from what I normally do but kind of gets your brain functioning again on a creative level. Yeah. I, I love that book. Good advice. This one's from Christina. This is the last one. Okay. Just listen to the first episode. Loved it. And I'm upset to hear how people reacted to your son's dream of owning an Aston Martin. My little cousin just turned 21, has Asperger's, and cars have been his thing his whole life. His Hot Wheels collection is insane, and he knows everything about cars. He can look at one off the street and tell me all about it. He went to community college to be a mechanic and graduated and now gets paid to do his favorite hobby. Nice. My aunt and uncle bought him a Lexus for his first car that he earned through getting good grades at school and attending some school social functions that were out of his comfort zone he lives breathes and dies by that car it means more to him that than a car would mean to most people so i get it it breaks my heart that people would give you guys flack for that and the people don't understand that different things mean different things to different people and that's okay we are all unique so judging is just stupid i can't wait till the kid gets his dream car thanks for the podcast oh thank you that makes me happy Pretty i cool. like that yeah cool congratulations i think that'd be great great job mechanic you know obsessive on 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 a specific thing and of course you'll be great at it you know yeah and when son get that ashton martin maybe not this year <laughs> seeing how nobody's purchased my show yet but who knows what the future may hold i'm in a movie with danny devito <laughs> <laughs> so who knows oh but yeah man that makes me feel so awesome those are great letters um please send us more letters getting better pod at gmail.com um we'll answer them sporadically <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast but we're gonna be banking up some episodes so we're gonna need letters mm -hmm. right yep. and I, I like answering them i like talking to people so um oh man you guys just really made my day and that was really really fun how much time did that kill <laughs> uh, like 22 oh perfect intro amount guys thank you so much Thank you for killing it with your letters today. I loved it. I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, we'll, we'll have our guests coming up with us. Um, it's a guy who who I just grew up loving. Um, great comedian. Um, had one of the best shows when I was a teenager because it was so different. And it dealt with um, dysfunction in the family. I felt like at a time where, where every show... Um, I saw it was kind of like, oh, everything's fake and everything's good. And it's all like Cosby show or, or, or um, everybody's got two parent household, Mr. Belvedere type stuff. You know, um, this was a show that was like, oh, my dad's messed up. I messed up. My mom was messed up. Everybody's messed up. And it's and that's funny. And um, one of the main reasons I wanted to get him on the show is because I'm trying to that's kind of what my material is about and what I like to write about and what my shows have been about is taking um putting the fun in the dysfunction and finding the uh, optimism and the positive and negative situations and i've been hit with a lot of resistance lately you know i got my project about my son and i and and, and that's been been um troubles I mean, we sold it and then we're now we're trying to sell it to another place and then the other project i wrote about my 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 dad and i when i when i was a kid and stuff when the main notes i got was like oh it's just too dark you know and it made me feel bad because i was like that's what my life and i just feel like that's the type of humor that i've always enjoyed and it's the type of humor that he created he's also a guy that lives outside of the hollywood business model he's very successful uh very respected and well known but you don't really see him a lot around the, um touring the comedy store or the improv or anything he puts out his own specials on his his website and um i'm just really interested to talk to him he's a very unique mind who, who um has a lot of opinions. Um, our guest is Christopher Titus, and he will be with us in just a moment. 
Are we ready, Halston? Oh, we're already going. You're good at producing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was like, so at that, at that point, it was an interrogation. Do you know that? If you're recording without us knowing, that's an interrogation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we didn't even know that. <laughs> that was some FBI shit. We haven't we even started yet. And you're like, okay, let's give Titus says off the mic. Oof. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> First of all, thank you for coming. I Come really... on, dude. Thanks for inviting me, man. You know, there's uh, there's some people I follow on Twitter, and there's some things that I and you're always really funny and and nice. And I've seen your comedy, and I just your 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 heart is always so pure. And there's so many cats that are bro comics that are just they're hard and mean, and you're not mean. And I think I think the meanness in comedy, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm loud, mm -hmm. but I always try to make it the meanness in comedy. You don't have that. I try not to. No, and I like that. I like that. I appreciate that. That's. Um, I guess that leads me in my first question to you right now is... Um, Why is your comedy so mean? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, my, my more question right now is, um, are there comics that you're fans of, newer comics that you're fans of now that um, what do you... What do you enjoy now? What do you see in comedy now? Because right now you're, um, I mean, you're definitely a veteran. You're. I hope you don't mind me calling you a legend, but I, I consider you one. I know how that probably would sound. But, I mean, you're a person. I mean, I, I grew up watching your show. You know, your show meant, meant a lot to me. And your stand-up <laughs> meant your a lot family to me. was not as... Yes. <laughs> not really well balanced. No. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I asked you in the show. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to okay, that. Okay, all right. But I want to um, ask you about what are you enjoying in comedy right now um it's weird man i've gotten to a place now where i've done it yeah i've been doing i mean i've been in 35 years now i started when i was 19 and uh i'm to the point now where i i maria bamford makes me laugh uh when i see Patton, when i see my comedy kind of uh a sense changed the guy Patton taught me about to reminded me that words are important like then then i went back again to carlin and i was like oh uh, you know i could always perform Actually, I used to do. I had used to have no jokes, um, but uh, but but Patton and Carlin reminded me how important words are. So I really started focusing on my writing, mm. um, and so those guys I love. Uh, Maria, I I I watch Maria because I'm just always stunned by it. And me, Maria Banford to me is like watching a magic trick because I'm never her how, I'm sure how she does it. Mm. I'm like, how the hell is she changing her voice that far? How is she? How is that line that she? she made dead funny and it's not even a setup punchline there's no structure to it that i recognize so maria is maria is a magic trick she she's she amazes me um i think i i i, I love anybody who has the balls to get on that stage you know always comedy you have to be psychotic to be a comedian you have to be you have to be it's a mental illness you have to get on stage in front of a bunch of strangers and think that you are the most talented charismatic funny person in the room yeah. that's that's serial killer shit what i have to say is the most important thing yeah, yeah exactly in this room of thousands of people <laughs> yeah, exactly that's psycho do you hear the psycho in it yeah yeah definitely <laughs> 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 oh man well i'm, I'm gl glad to hear because those are some of my favorite comedians and i like what you said about um what carlin because i think it, it is showing um and and some of your your recent specials, I think you you you've shifted a lot to be because you when I watched you when I was younger, it was very personal, very story driven, a right. lot of um, personality driven, yeah. and now you're 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 very topical, you're very. Um, this one specific though. Yeah, this, yeah, no, this one, the, yeah, the latest Amerigedon, one, Amerigedon, yeah, the latest one specific, yeah. the one before, but it's still still personal. But I mean, I think. Um, and you're very prolific. You you coming out with specials like every every year, every year, two year, years, and, a yeah, half, year and a half, two, two years, years yeah. yeah, yeah, between a year and a half, two years. And and you're doing this kind of um, with your own business model, yeah. with with, with, yeah. with your website, and these are things that that interest me a lot. Um, so I want to know more about uh i want to know more about your business model and you operating outside of of the typical industry and still because you're touring is that, a lot is that starting to get around now that, I, that titus is like titus doesn't i don't yeah i uh well i mean listen at, if you sit down uh the barry gordy model won't work anymore you know the old motown model that we're we're going to take 80 percent of your money of your talent doesn't work anymore and you can say what you will but that model still works they're still using it. Mm. We just turned down a deal. There's a com there's a company that they all they do is comedy. It's all they do. They're the biggest comedy. And the contract they sent me, I I looked at it and I was like, 
Okay, so no money up front. All right. Uh, we're gonna, they're going to put it around the world. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we get 10% sales fee. Okay. Now, this is a special that was already produced. We already produced it. It was done. I put my money into it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't getting my money back. Then the list the list of expenses was literally shit. It, was, it, it looked worse than any accountant I've ever seen. It was just this list of expenses. And I was like, that's, I don't, I, sign spinner. There's no sign spinner. Why are we getting a sign? <laughs> when did, I didn't approve a sign spinner. And, uh, and so I said no. And then my manager got mad at me and I fired him. Um, I've been doing it since Norman Rockwell. Showtime, when we did Showtime, um, Norman Rockwell it was bleeding is my first special that aired. We we Showtime for whatever reason showed the special, gave me the rights to it. So, and I'm a huge fan of Prince. I love Prince, mm -hmm. and Prince. I never forget on the back of uh, of Chaos and Disorder. There's actually a fuck you to Warner Brothers on the back of it. There's on the back of the album. It says, I'm like, this is the last piece of music uh, the artist will ever be doing for Warner Brothers. And and then he started making his own money, and I brought stuff off the online from Prince, and I, I just I thought, why can't I? Every, there's a lot of gatekeepers, and everybody wants to tell you no. Well, you know how talented you are. I see how talented you are. Why would you accept no? So many of us comics just accept no, and uh, and actors and everybody. But fuck it, we can get a camera for it. You can get a, a, a like a, a like a 4K camera if you got you know six grand, whatever, three grand even. You can get something that'll shoot and look good. And you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, what do you want to know about the business? What do you want? What do you want to know about my business model? Now let's turn into a Tony Robbins yeah. seminar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, I think, uh, I don't need to know specifics, but I just like, I like that mindset. I like that independent mindset. And I think especially for someone who, who's had a career as long as yours, you, you need that because at a certain point there's places, like you said, the gatekeepers or wherever be like, oh, well, you're, you're, you're out of the age group for our, our audience and we don't, yeah. you're not, you're not new anymore. So we right. don't need you. Uh, born with a defect. It's all about raising kids. And they were like, uh, it's about raising kids. We're not going to put it on, you know, our demographic is okay. And then on that, we sold that special and I made, it's funny. Here's the thing. I can, all I can, all I can tell you is this. If you do it yourself and you work your ass off, you will make more money with your own comedy than anybody's ever paid you. I guarantee it. Like I've, I've proved it. Oh, year after year after year. And then when you go to the shows, people are more apt to buy your stuff because they know it's not going to Warner Brothers. It's not going to Paramount. It's going to you. That's very smart. <laughs> very smart it's scary it's scary too man like, by the way i didn't do it because they were throwing money at me yeah. i wasn't like they were just i'm like no no you keep your multi-million dollars i'm gonna do it myself that wasn't why uh what happened was was uh we did we shot never because we shot nevolution with the company i'm talking about by the way nevolution and uh they've been telling me like every special like i got ripped off so bad on love is evil like i really got ripped off i went with a company i got boned bad and um, they made, they sent me a sheet. They made like this ton of money. They sold 35,000 units or something crazy for me anyways. And I was like, okay. And I saw the total. I said, send me some breakdowns. And the breakdown, it went, it, it, they kept expenses and sign spinner and, and then this and that and production. And, and it got down. And at the bottom, it said they owed me $1.80. Mm. And I said, just write fuck you on the paper. I go, just <laughs> just send me a piece of paper that says fuck you on it. Don't, don't make me read. <laughs> just big block letters, fuck you. And there you go. Even Barry Gordy was was like this deal sucks <laughs> yo man i would never let the temptation sign a better deal on this shit so <laughs> right <laughs> i didn't know either <laughs> so uh i i so after that special we did we got offered to do the next one and i said and i was like well, what's it gonna cost to do it and, the, and my manager at the time told me and i said mm, it's a lot of money and so i called I started calling them rental places. I just, you know, again, I, it wasn't like, it was just like, I didn't want to get boned again. Like, why should the artist get the least amount of money? You know, and that's live performing too. Um, uh, and so uh, we even did, I even shot my own movie last year, you know, um, uh, and that's going worldwide and it's going to be in 68 English speaking countries now. So here's the thing. So I called them and they said, it's going to be uh, 130 grand to shoot it. And I said, okay. And I said, let me call you guys back. And I picked up the phone. We live in LA, right? So I, I started calling rental houses, and I said, well, "I need, uh, I need a truck. I need with the editing, with the editing a switcher in it, and I need four HD cameras. Um, and that would be four K cameras. And uh, and what can you give me?" And the guy goes, "Well, we'll give you a ten man crew, four cameras, sound." I go, "How many mics?" And they said, "Well, we'll give you two shotgun mics or three shotgun mics, uh, a stage mic." I got. I, have, I said, "I have my own lab." They said, "Okay." Uh, he goes, "What do you need mic wise?" I said, three or four a stage mics, a shotgun, so we can get the laughter. And he goes, uh, and a soundboard. And he goes, okay, uh, 
all four, we have 10 man crew, all that camera work, everything, and a truck, and it's 16 grand. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. How come these guys are telling me it's this much and, and it's like, it's 10% of what they're charging me. So what happened was, is I, I called them back and I said, here's what I can, here's, I, and I, I did some figures and I called some post houses and I broke down what it was actually gonna cost me to the number. And I called them, I said, well, here's again, I can do it myself for this much. And they instantly said without negotiating, okay, we'll do it for that. Mm. So at that point I knew, wait a minute. Um, and and I, it was kind of peeking behind the curtain. So we shot that special and then they said, we want to do a distribution deal for it. And I said, what's it going to pay? And the guy looked me right in the face and he goes, well, we're going to give you this much money. And I go, will I ever see another dime from it? And he goes, probably not. He goes, but you're going to be in Walmart. Mm. And I was like, okay. Uh, and I said, no, thanks. And that pissed them. Oh, man. The, you know, the people say in Hollywood the most powerful word is no. Um, and, uh, but if you really want to piss people off who are making money off your talent, tell them no. Because <laughs> that, 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 that kind of knows the worst. So I went and I made, that, I made that special myself. I found it. You know, we went and we produced it. Um, I bought editing equipment. We, we, we put it together. We packaged it. Uh, that one was called Nevolution, and we sold on my own. I sold, I, I sold. I mean, I sold a ton of them on my own. We, I mean, the, the first initial order we blew out. We, you know, it was it was a risk too, but it was twenty bucks a piece, and I think we blew out five thousand of them in the first two months. And now you can say that's not a lot of units, but the diff Andy DeFranco has been doing this too. The difference is if if okay, so I sold five thousand units at twenty bucks. They cost me a buck twenty to produce. I hate to do all the math for these no, people. No, please, I love I, it. Okay, okay. Um, so, so here's what happened. So that's fig. Just just figure that out. That's a hundred and whatever it is over over a couple months. And had I gone with the contract, I would have gotten the, the you know a tenth of that, mm -hmm. and then I would have had to track them down for my dollar per disc I sold while they made nineteen. So at one point you just go, now the problem is this, a lot of guys don't want to work that hard. You have to, you have to sit down, you have to d design the packaging, you have to hire a guy. There, there's money you put into it, but at the end of the day, it's yours, mm. you know? And they, they actually, the, this new deal that I wanted, that they, I just said no to, they were going to own, they wanted to take all eight of my specials and they said, but we want to own them in perpetuity. What? So they would own them forever. And I said, nah, come on, man. I don't want my kids to have to fight you. <laughs> you, know, that, yeah, you know, I'm gonna die one day. I don't want my kids to be like, yeah, dad, dad didn't leave us anything. So I kept them. I have, I own all my specials except for one. Um, I own them all and I've produced the last four and, and we just did a movie special unit that's uh, won some awards and stuff and I wrote it and directed it and Peter Farrelly helped me with the, with the, with script notes and stuff. It's been, it's been a, it, and, and I think, I think it, it pisses everybody off. My, my agent told me, I said, how come I can't then make this happen? He goes, cause you don't want to work with anybody. You want to do it all yourself. And I'm like, okay. All right. <laughs> so all right. you're. I'm not going to be Elvis. Transform yourself into your own your own mogul in that regard. Yeah. Well. <laughs> it's like you, That's you, a big word, man. I know it's a big word, but you can be a mogul of a small business. There it you go. There small, you Empire go. doesn't. It, well, here's it ranges wanna, in size. So here's what I want to do. I want to help young comics now. I know what it costs to do it. Um, I want we. There's a company I'm working with right now. Um, an indie company, and we want, and they have a they have a channel. They're in they're in 120 countries, 68 English speaking countries and i want to help comics like you guys want to like i have a studio i have a i have editing stuff you guys want to anybody any comics out there want to make a special um we'll do it for a price that you'll be like holy crap and even if we put our money in we'll just get our money back first and then uh, and then we'll do you do it with 80 20 split and you guys can you guys can it and after three years you get your special back and that's that's the right way to do it i mean you can't you just to rate people over and over and then all of a sudden these companies own all all the assets, it just sucks. I, I can't believe people are getting so screwed over. I didn't know we were gonna talk about this, man. This is weird, you got me You got me kind of like, I feel I feel like, uh, <laughs> I feel ambushed a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> I think people don't know, I, and I, you know, my TV show, I, I, this started a long time ago. So when I had my TV show, Titus, I had been through two different deals, they wouldn't let me write. Mm. And you're funny, you're really funny. All, all comics, we do, we have to write. And people don't understand, we have to be funny because we have to eat on that. Yeah. Do you understand? Like, there's we're not like some Ivy League school where parents pay for our school or we're paying off a school loan, and we got to be kind of kind of funny. And now we work right on a TV show. We had to eat and and pay for shelter yeah, with jokes. Support my son. That and support you, our families. That's right. So, guess what? We had to figure out quick. 
what was funny and what wasn't. And if we didn't figure that out, we went to substitute teaching jobs. That's what <laughs> happened to us. So we had to figure it out. So what I did was um, uh, I said, after my two deals went bad with these other writers, which I didn't, like I was like, it's weird because like so they hand you something and you read it and as a comic you read it and you go, and this is my arrogance and I, I get how arrogant this sounds. But I go, this isn't funny. I'd go, this isn't funny. I know, I, I've been writing jokes at that point for 15 years. This isn't funny. Uh, and they'd be like, yeah, it is. I go, no, I, I, no. I go, this won't make an audience laugh. So after the second deal failed, I, I said I wouldn't do another deal. I took, I took a course called the Landmark Forum and I, and I said I wouldn't do another deal unless I was a writer on it. So we got offered a deal for uh, the idea I came with Titus. Um, a, a, some very amazing writers, Jack Kenny and Brian Hargrove um, came in and they, they actually, the network said no. They said flat out no. They said, we love the idea, want to do it. You're going to have these guys write it. <clears throat> and I told them, I said, well, I'm not, I said, I don't want to do it then. And, uh, and they said, uh, again, no. And I said, uh, and they said, well, uh, okay, go ahead and you write a version of the script. So I had to write a version of my own script. And, uh, and I, it was the idea I wanted, the three cameras, it was Titus. So they wrote their version and I wrote my version. And they took my version and they read it and they called me back and they said, wanna have a meeting with you? And we sat down with them and they said, we've gone to the network with your script and we've told them that he is as good as any writer we've ever worked with on a sitcom and he gets to be executive producer and one of the writers on the show. And those guys stood up for me, Jack Kenny and Brian Hargrove. Jack Kenny did um, Warehouse, Warehouse Five too and stuff. He's and he's 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 really brilliant, and Brian Hargrove really brilliant. And they taught me about story and structure and making it right. I knew how to write jokes and I knew about yeah, story, but there's a difference. Yeah, you know, putting the acts together. And, yeah, sitcom yeah. structure is really yeah. yeah. Especially because you got to do it in like twenty six pages, twenty four pages. Like it's you're, you're writing, you write forty eight pages. You turn on, they go, "We, did, how, what did you write? An yeah, epic?" You got all these jokes, and you forget about <laughs> exposition, and they're yeah. like, "What the hell's the story?" And, and these characters. That's why we had a rule in, on, on Titus. We had a rule that I wouldn't let. I, I they would say we'd never gangbang the script. We would all break one out. We'd break out the story. And then we'd pick a writer and go, this is your script. And we'd let them go away for three days and write it. Because I, I, I think, because at least that guy's brain, we had a through line to the story then. Didn't, whatever we all came up with together, it went, it got filtered through one guy. So the voice was clean. Mm. <clears throat> I think when you gangbang scripts, you have a guy in one, you have three guys in one room and six guys in another room trying to fix scenes. Those scenes won't match anymore, yeah. you know? You know, it's like, it's like all of a sudden this, there's a jazz break in, in a rock song. You're like, what the <laughs> fuck happened here? So, so. That's where I learned all my writing was Titus, and, and I got a Writers Guild nomination for it, which is for an episode I wrote. Yeah, I mean, it's a great show. It was an excellent show. Yeah. I got many questions. Um, one thing, because I was went back and watched some episodes today, and I didn't realize um, that your dad on the show that um, w that we both worked with him. I did three episodes of um, A Man with a Plan with Stacy Keach, yeah. and and man, that is a talented man, yeah. and that is a great actor. Timing like no other, <laughs> right? Um, so I I only worked with him for three weeks. What so was it like asked, working with him? Uh, <laughs> I mean. It was, it was really professional. It was fun to watch someone who was like, okay, I know my stuff. I'm leaving now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that yep. was my favorite part <laughs> yeah. was him being like, all right, I did my stuff. I got it. I'm leaving. And I'm, and I'm, and I was like, well, I, I can't do that. Right. And they're like, no, <laughs> so you're staying it. We're beating you to death. That's, yeah. that's Stacy Keach. Yeah. And, and, but he was very, um, he was very giving with me with working with him and the scenes that I was with him. He, he was kind and, and was like, told me I was funny and, 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 um, and I knew he, and he did not seem like the type of person who would just tell you things if he just, you know, if he no, didn't no, believe no. him. No, Stacy, Stacy doesn't have to be nice to anybody if he doesn't want to. Exactly, that's yeah. what that's what I got from yeah. him. And but um, I mostly I just tried to shut up and watch because I was like, this is a man who who clearly knows what he he is doing. He's been doing it for a long time. He was annoying in one way because Stacy's so good. They called him the American Olivier. That's what he was called for many years, and he. So I would have the joke. I would have the punchline. It would be my laugh. He would make the setup so funny that I'd be like, motherfucker, did you just, you just hurt me. <laughs> like, so then I'd have to, but, but what it made me do is it brought me up. Mm -hmm. And there's a joke, we, there's, and he would, you know what he, you know what he did? Because we read a lot of people for, for, the, for the father in that. And my dad was such a kind of a specific guy. And we had like, like these big actors that came in and read for it. But they were, some of them were very sitcom-y. And Stacy, not one time was he sitcom. He came in 
and we did the audition and Jack and Brian were there and I was doing it with Stacy and and he, he it was a scene where he was screaming at me and he really turned and he, he and there's a there's a very fine line between actual dramatic screaming at somebody and comedic screaming yeah. it's a very there's it's a usually fi- this distance yeah mm-hmm. there's there's a fine yeah. line oh, where, where yeah, it, bas- it, it breaks that line it's not comedy anymore. it stops being comedy it's yeah. right it starts being tragedy and i'll tell you a story about that from titus too where i, I actually took it too far and they they stopped me and they and they go titus you just scared the shit out of the entire crew um so stacy uh he he takes it and he just gets mad but he's comical mad he just got bigger and bigger and was great and at one point but he was yelling at me so Brian, Jack and Brian are sitting in the audition room laughing their ass off. And I'm like, this guy's going to punch me. Like, it felt like he's going to punch me. And he, he leaves the room. It was awesome. He leaves the room, and, and Jack and Brian are still laughing. And he goes, they go, what do you think of him? And I go, he scares the hell out of me. And they go, that's the guy. And he did. There's a joke. We, it's the longest laugh we ever got on Titus. It was a joke. Robert Hawkins, comedian Robert Hawkins, wrote this joke. Um, I painted my dad's car. And he, this is based on a true story. I painted my dad's uh, car. I'm a car guy. And um, my dad got busted for drunk driving. He blamed that he got stopped on the paint job I put on his car because it was a custom paint job. And I was like, no. You, so in the, in the show, I go, I go, you were, you, I go, I go, maybe you got busted for drunk driving because you were driving drunk. And Stacy turns and he goes, no way. He goes, driving this car around, I'm like a black guy driving a powder donut. And, and like the audience, like laughed and then they thought is that racist and they went no he's making fun of cops being racist and then they laughed again and they, and we're standing there and this this rolling laugh is going on and if there's a it's an it's in one of the outtakes uh, that we did and I'm standing there and the laughter won't stop it's like four different waves of you're laughter trying hold. I'm trying to hold <laughs> and I finally just looked at my watch and I said fuck it and I walked off the stage because <laughs> we had to start over again and then even editing the second time I got another laugh and we had to actually we had to shorten the laugh just for time it was such a great joke Stacy. yeah no, that's a, that's a I've yeah, been blessed to work with Stacy. amazing Genius. joke and it, it does hit you I can see how it would hit an audience on levels at the oh that's beautiful yeah yeah because they caught themselves they went oh, it's racist wait no it's against cops and they laughed again and then and then Stacy just kept he 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 held here's the thing I was standing there waiting for the laugh to stop because I'm a comic Stacy continued to act angry so he stayed in the moment the entire time and just kept looking at me like he was gonna kill me and I think that, and then he was milking it. At one point, I was like, come on, Keech. You know, he's so good. Yeah, he was so good. He just kept beating on it. He, and he, and he, he's, he's a good man. He's, he's, he's a really good human being, too. I think that's, I think we meet, we've all met people in this business that we, and I think some people might say it about me, that just like, that guy's a dick. I think somebody might say, but to Keech is just a, just a, just a mensch, just a good guy. Yeah, I could, yeah, I was just there for, for three weeks, but yeah, he was, um, I was like, man, I'm luck- lucky to get to work with you. Consummate pro. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have questions about you creating Titus. And um, because one of the main reasons why I asked you to be on the podcast is that, um, like you said, I, I grew up watching your show. And it is because I had my own dysfunctional family. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of my humor um, comes from that. It comes from mining the positivity out of negative situations. Um, I you know my my grew up and my mom was in an abusive relationship and then moved in with my dad and he was in an abusive relationship with a woman and then um and then i had my son when i was 20 and my son has autism and and then my relationship doesn't work out and i'm trying to write shows about these things right. and i find great humor in those things and constant like i mean i try i saw the show about me and my son and then constant notes about them about them trying to make it broader and and then i tried to sell the show about me and my 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 dad and the I get out of a pitch pitch meeting and they were like oh they're gonna pass because they say it's too dark and I just was like they said my life is too dark right for American consumption <laughs> and like, I'm like I'm and there's here? a list of shows behind and Breaking Bad is like the number one show at the time You're like I'm sorry what yeah yeah and that's the thing I, I don't get and I think that I find so amazing about about you able to accomplish what you did is that because w- when your show came out the la- landscape was probably even less yeah. like Seinfeld, that. It was Seinfeld yeah yeah it was like it was 
Seinfeld and friends and fakeness yeah. and, and yep. being super rich and, and no jobs, you know? And I liked shows like, like yours, like Roseanne, like Grace Under Fire that showed blue collar, that showed people with faults. And that's what I kind of write with now. And I'm finding the same, um, if not, you know, hurdles and in, in issues. I want to kind of ask your advice on how to deal with it. And, and because I know that's funny. I know these things are funny. Right. And, and what, what, here's the thing, Dan. Okay. So here's what I found with Titus. We got really lucky. Uh, I, people would go, how did you get that show out in the time of Seinfeld and Friends? Because it was the time of Seinfeld and Friends. Because there was nothing else. Like, I mean, the, the closest thing to it, people said, was um, Married with Children. But even that was that was really cartoony. Yeah. We played it very real. We played it, you know, that was Jack and Brian's. Like, they were like, look, guys, we're going to ground this in reality all the time. As far as we go out, it's got to come back to a grounded place. Mm. But we the first episode we wrote was called dad is dead like and I, and i and they kept going why how come we're not we have stacy keach why is he not in this episode to the last five seconds and i said because i said you guys remember archie bunker and they said yeah i said well archie bunker when archie bunker walked in the room you went before he said a word you went oh shit like you were just like it's coming here we go I wanted to build a character in Keech in that first episode where when he walked in, the audience was already afraid of him. I wanted them to go, uh-oh. <laughs> so we wrote Dad is Dead, and I think when we wrote Dad is Dead, um, the network, because there's low money, I had some big money deals, and then this deal was like, you know, this low money deal, because they, they thought the script was too dark, and and then Jack and Brian came on, and they had been on this show called Holding the Baby, which is very sick on me, uh, and not minding their talent at all, and they... We wrote this, we, we actually combined them. Remember I said we did the two scripts? We combined the two scripts. Um, so here's what happened is that we, the network, the show was so outrageous with the flashbacks and I was talking about my this Jewish girlfriend that used to punch me in the face and we used a lot of my, mind my act. I think the network thought, well, this will never work. They went, this is never gonna work. So they left us alone. They just, we kind of flew under the radar for a minute. And then um, Mindy Schulteis, who was the producer on the show, and Michael Hanel, they were awesome. They were they were with the 20th at the time. They The story I heard was Mindy went in, and they had just switched presidents. Doug Herzog had left it. Doug Herzog loved us, and he was great. But then Sandy Grusha came in uh, for the studio and before he went to the network. And Mindy Schulteis took the script. They were saying, no, it's too dark. We're not doing it. And Mindy Schulteis slammed the script on the, on the desk, and she said, he, she goes, you show me a fucking funnier script that we put out this season. You show me one funnier script and I'll walk away. Go ahead. And she just, she did something that people don't do in Hollywood. They stand up for something and they and they stick. They don't just go, okay, what do you guys all think? All right, she stood up for mm -hmm. it. And they said, okay, and they gave us a pilot and they knew it wasn't gonna work. In fact, they almost fired Cynthia the day, the day of, the, the, the day before we shot the pilot. And then Jack and Brian, again, being very brilliant, Jack goes, it's not her fault. She's a great actor. She's the only funny girl. We, we, we saw, we had 225 women for their parole. And she goes, he goes, he goes, it ain't her, it's us. And and I remember, I remember sitting back like, wow, that's, wow. So that night we went in and rewrote her entire role. We kept the script the same, but everything she said, we changed her entire attitude. Uh, made her sardonic we made her really rough and we came back and the next run through the next day they were like gonna recast they were gonna stop the pilot and recast her and we rewrote her and she came in and blew the roof off and to the point where jokes that i was getting she was now getting like she was killing my jokes mm -hmm. which whoa but i don't care i told those guys you know seinfeld said something i heard something that seinfeld said i don't want to be the funniest guy i want everybody around me to be funnier Show's called Seinfeld, and I took that to heart. I yeah. didn't want, I didn't want to, I, 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 I'll get mine. I'll get mine. Yeah, well, I've done this a long time. I'll get mine. You know? That that's how. I, so and you just you there's nothing. There's never anything wrong with surrounding yourself with more talent. No, I'll get mine. Sometimes you could just get off a look. They were so funny. I could just look at them, and I would get a laugh off a look. But I think everybody wants to worry that they're going to be the one. So here's what happened. So so the, because it was Seinfeld and everything was so light, we were so different. But now sitcoms have gotten so dark and so silly and um, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Everyone's pushing the envelope so far that at one point you push past, here's what I think. At one point you push past the reality envelope. Absolutely. And, and to this to this silly, absurd envelope. Yeah. And it seems edgy, but it's not, it's just fake. Yeah. And and what you wanna do is you wanna keep it in, in grounded in reality. Yes. 
Uh, but no one has the balls, man. You got to remember, every one of these people is trying to hold on to their job, and none of them have written a script. None of them have been funny in front of a live audience. None of them have written a script. That's why. That's why network notes. Another reason, uh, by the way, another reason I'm probably uh, I'm probably doing it myself is because I'm kind of a pain in the ass to work with because I don't I don't. If you come into me, you're a network executive, and you go, you go, you know, we don't think this is funny. I go, okay. How long did you stand up comedy? Well, I've never done stand-up comedy. I, I wrote on my uh, on my paper. I wrote a humor call on my paper and, and when I was going to Harvard. Okay? Um, or a guy, what did you used to do for a living? I'm a lawyer. You, have you written a movie script? No. Have you written a comedy script? No. So you don't think it's going to be funny? Mm. <laughs> and, then I, and then no one wants to hear that. I'm that guy. Yeah, I'm, that's the thing I, I realized um, just from... I went and did this award show for casting directors. And to me, one of the main reasons I was going was like, I've been coming from this mindset of like, I don't get to know these people. I don't know their names. I'm mostly terrified of them. Right. And so I was yeah. like, let me not be afraid of them. Let me go know their names. Let me know who they are. And I go to this award show and I'm watching them go up there and accept awards and do speeches. And 80% of them can't talk in front of a live audience. And I go, why the fuck am I afraid of you? Yeah. You can't do what I do. Right. You can see it and you might, be, you can, you are good at what you do as in like, okay, this is the vision that the director has and, I, and this guy matches. Right. And I can, fine, you do that job well, but I should not be afraid of you when it comes to artistic talent right. because you can't even talk in front of 50 people. Right. You know? And right. that, that was something that I was but glad also, I learned. But what are they doing judging what's funny and what isn't? Like, that's, that's what bothers me. Here's, there's been some great executives. I, I've worked with some really awesome people. Um, Mindy Schultes and Michael Hanel. Um, um, the guy used to run Comedy Central, and he was head of Fox when I got there, Doug Herzog. Doug Herzog was, he was, here's how good of an executive he was. Oh, he's now, so good. He's legendary that I know who he yeah, is. Yeah, he's legendary. And uh, Bob Greenblatt was good, and, uh, and John, uh, John Langreff over at FX. Because here's what they do. They, they, they hear the idea. They're good at recognizing a good idea. They don't want to piss on it. That's what everybody wants to put their scent on it. Because he knows, John Glad some of these guys know that, oh, if I, if I green light that show and let the creators do what they're good at, I'm going to get the credit anyway. There's other people that go, oh, if I green light that show, I need to make change it so I can say I changed it. Um, and I've worked with some really bad executives that came in and wanted to put their mark on something. And the reason the reason Titus ended, oh, here's another thing. Uh, you're a much nicer guy than me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Because I go, when I went to the, I got Titus canceled because I went into a meeting with with the new president. We had three presidents in three years and with Gail Berman. And I, and, uh, and I want to say I got it canceled. I just didn't agree with her. She wanted to change the show. And I, in a meeting, I just said, no. I go, we're not, I go, what you just told us to do, Dharma and Greg just did. We're not doing that. I go, we've been doing the show for three years. It's killing. We're, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Now, that's what you say in a meeting to the network president. You say, we'll try that. Sure, let's look at that. We'll see. We're and, open. Yeah, but I'm a comic. And, and how do you take a guy who's been, since he was 19, saying saying what he wanted on stage, mm -hmm. being funny and, and in front of a live audience and not and telling the truth? You can't, you take that guy, you don't take that guy to the meeting. If you want to bullshit, take the bullshit guy. Don't take me. Um, so, but I should have shot up. Uh, but but that's okay. So I have a question about that. Do you do you feel regret in, in that, or do you feel like this is just who who I am, or do you feel like that's a lesson that you 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 learned? I actually have two regrets on both sides. First regret was uh, my biggest regret is that because I spoke up at that meeting, her and I were no longer fun. And any excuse she wanted to cancel the show, she could. I should have made her my ally, and I didn't. I made the crew my ally. I made the guys at the gate front gate my ally. Uh, made the studio my ally, but I wasn't the network. I just the, the network again. There are too many people that didn't know didn't know anything about comedy were coming in and telling me what was funny, and and I take that you know this. I've made a living since I was. I've had to pay my bills with it, so I know what. No, I'm, but I'm also not good at diplomacy because I'm just going. I I always look. I was taught like this. I was raised by a hard father. He told you the truth how it was. If you got a D, he didn't go, you'll do better next time. He went, listen, dumbass, this is a D. You know what it stands for? Duh. He would just, my, my dad would just rip me and thinking that was going to help. If I got a B, it had to be an A. Like there was always something, and he was dead honest. So I was raised dead honest. So I, in meetings, I would not be very diplomatic. Um, this I just wrote something and sent it to a showrunner, uh, and I told him we had to talk today because he said, I, I said, listen, if this goes and we work together, I'm not going to any meetings. <laughs> I said, yeah. Yeah. I said, so you have learned your yeah, yeah, you come back, come back to the writer's room and lie to me. Tell me, no, they loved it. It was great. We have a couple of changes we're going to make, but that's all. Uh, fine, uh, but I'm not going to listen to... Um, anyway, so so that regret was yes. 
and but here's my regret. My regret's not that the show got canceled for me. It's not, re- you know, because I'm I've done fine. My regret is that it was 150 people that worked on that show. Yes. And they all had jobs, yes. and we had a blast every week. And the people that I work with, the, the actors were awesome, and the writers, the writing team we had was so amazing. My biggest regret is those guys. I didn't get to work with those guys. I didn't get to work with those guys anymore, and I lost those people their jobs. And I take the hit for it. But it was 12 years. You know, someone told me recently. They said uh, it, Titus. It was like 18 years ago. You know, it was like 18 years ago. No, it was 2002. 16 years ago. When are you gonna fucking give give yourself a break? I've apologized for it. I did it. Here's the biggest regret. That happened about four or five months before the show got canceled. And the the, the executive who it was a woman named Gail Berman, and Gail Berman got fired from Paramount um, because she was impossible to work with. This is after she wor- was was a president of Fox, and that's why she got fired at Fox too. Actually, I take that back. She left to go to Paramount with Brad Gray, and then so here's what happened is. I get a call from uh, Dana Walden, who's an ama- another amazing executive. Dana Walden at 20 is first. I think she's president of Fox now. She, yeah, her, her, her and Gary Newman, just Gary Newman, I apologized to him after the show. I counseling. He goes, Titus, he goes, don't apologize to me. He goes, I never saw anybody work harder than you did. And that was really nice of him to say. And and and, and Dana Walden, they're just two great people. They, they Fox, by the way, that's who's head of Fox now, right? Dana and Gary. So mm-hmm. that, good. Good. Fox is going to be awesome. Anyway, so I'm on the way. Gail Berman wants to have lunch with me. We're, we're talking about getting the show renewed for the fourth season. Then we're in the we're at the end of the third season, and I get a phone call from Dana. And she's like, "You go and you kiss her ass at this lunch." I think I set it up because I wanted to apologize to, for that meeting. Mm-hmm. And 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 I go, "Okay, okay." She goes, "No, I'm not kidding. Don't you give her any shit. Don't you say anything wrong. You kiss her ass." And that's really not who I am. But it's okay. But I said, "Okay, okay, okay, okay." okay. Go to the meeting, and Gail just sat there, and, and I, I remember saying, I don't know if I should be telling this. I just kind of, yeah, my career's already over anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and I just said, you want a baby? This if we, if you need, we want us to have a baby. We'll have a baby if you want to do. And and it, and it was, I call it growing a tumor on my soul. I was kissing ass so hard that at one point I thought, oh, this is a, just a bad taste in my mouth. It felt like I was eating poison. And I, but I kept going. I was like, you know, and, and we'll do what you want. I, I go, I shouldn't have spoke up in that meeting, and. That was my biggest regret because she still canceled the show. Mm. Uh, someone said, Robert Town said years ago, uh, show business is just high school with money. That's all it is. Here's what I should have said at that meeting. I should have said, listen, I screwed up in that meeting. I shouldn't have said that to you. I should have t- given you more respect, especially in front of your people. The reality is we're giving you a funny show, a laugh out loud funny show every week. And if you want us to continue that, we'll gladly do that. Um, and if you want to cancel it, I want you to know something. That's on you. That's on you. We're going to keep doing it. And again, I truly apologize for disrespecting you in front of your people. We should have had the argument in your office by ourselves. And I apologize. I'm going to get back to work. At least then, when, if she canceled it, I can say, well, you know, I stood for what I stood for and that was it. The other way, I licked her ass to the point where I was like, wow. I, and she still canceled it. Yeah, you she did still it to the canceled. point where... where there's no point of her even being like okay you know it's like yeah. i can't trust you what do you mean yeah you know maybe that was it yeah you know but you know they so so here's the thing i learned it's stand up for shit man stand up for yourself and when someone comes up to you especially your next time you do your script a don't be me totally because you're but you can't be you're just you're, you're much more gentle so but there is a point you have to stop them because the more you agree with them especially Okay, when you were doing your show, did they cross into a territory where you knew that you knew what they were saying wasn't going to work? Yeah. Okay, what did you do? Uh, okay, okay. Um, for for the one now, we we left them, and now we're re re, re pitch, pitching. Good. And what one before we went with their notes, and then they passed on the show. You went with their notes, did everything they wanted, and they said, you know what, this really lost its edge. Yeah, and then they picked up another version of the same. Show. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Why Hollywood Sucks with me and Ron Funches. Christopher Titus here. Ron Funches over there. Uh, we're going to talk to you why Hollywood will just suck the life out of you and make you grow a tumor. Ron, continue. It was the exact same show. <laughs> same network, same executives, same Oh, no.
How did the show do? Uh, it's coming back for a second season, uh, so it's doing okay. But I don't, I don't wish them no harm. It would, um, the thing I know is that you can't if we matter. made that show, I wouldn't have been happy with it. The people who respect me and that I respect wouldn't have liked the show. It's not funny. The show that has came out that's the same version of it is not funny, and I'm, I'm happy that my name is not associated. Awesome. With that. So here's what I did at the meeting when I sold Titus. I, they, I, I pitched the show out. They said, um, "Will people get this?" And I go, "Yeah." I go, "I go, I, I go." You guys understand? I take a poll every night. I'm on stage yes. across the country. I take a poll. That's I, what I'm I, saying. I, I to know. People. I know if people make funny. So this is funny. It works everywhere. All these jokes have been vetted. So these other guys that are writing a script and hoping it works, these have been vetted. Um, that being said, um, I want to do a show, and, and you know, I, I always, I always try to write something that has a meaning to it. Like it has to, uh, like I want people to to get something besides funny. Funny, you, you and I are good at. But to find something else, like Titus, I wanted to cause a paradigm shift in the way people saw the word dysfunctional. Because mm. dysfunctional people I know, I, in Armageddon, I don't want some normal people that their parents raised them well. I don't know, give me some <laughs> fucked up people, why? Because we know when it's coming, how it's coming, and how to get armed for when it's coming. Uh, you, these people are like, why is everything so weird? Like, I don't yeah. want those people. Well, I think the um, a lot of people who were affected by the past elections really showed the show who had gone through trauma before and who yep. had not. Yeah. Because a lot of people who were like, "Wow, could this happen in my life?" And it's like, this is the worst thing that has happened to you. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, I kind of feel sorry for those people sometimes. And then, and then I realized that they 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 were happy for a long time, and then I feel sorry for me again. <laughs> 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 so so uh, I told him at the meeting I said I want to do a show that's going to cause a paradigm shift in the way people see their screwed up lives and I go and it's going to be laugh out loud funny three different film styles and they go well uh, are you, well, what if we wanted to change this and I go no I just said and I didn't say it mean I didn't, that's the problem you have to go in the meeting with not with a chip on your shoulder you have to go into a meeting with like no that's not what I want to do Yeah, yeah it's okay vision. and, I, and I, so I told him I said, I said well so if you guys don't want to do that that's okay I said someone else will and I can tell you a story. You guys went, and by the way, as me and uh, Christopher Titus and Ron Punch is back with Why Hollywood Sucks, I'm about to tell you a story about uh, a pitch meeting I had at NBC once. So it's Titus, same show, same exact show. Uh, this is a meeting we'd had maybe the week before. I go to NBC. This is the Risk Rock story. I go to NBC, sit down with an executive, and she's amped. She's like, we love this idea. It's awesome. And she takes off, uh, she, on her counter, she had a rock that said Risk on it like from the successories, remember the successories? These inspirational stuff. Yeah. And she slams it on the table and she goes, that's what we're about at NBC. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now she, she goes, so we're up for doing this show. And I'm like, all right. And we walk out and my agent goes, that's the best meeting I've ever taken. And I'm like, all right. We get in the elevator, we go downstairs, we go the next day, we get a call. Um, they think the show's a little too edgy. <laughs> And I, so I start writing a letter and I get sent it to my agent to get approval. This is the chip on my shoulder. I go and it said, by the way, we saw the risk rock. Please put it in this box and send it back to us. You have <laughs> And he goes, we're not sending this. <laughs> but I, at least I was smart enough to send it to him first. Yeah. Uh, so they're all about well, risk. I've done that to my manager. I'm like, you <laughs> tell them this. And I'm like, she didn't tell them nothing. <laughs> 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 yeah exactly okay okay christopher yeah we'll tell them uh -huh. yeah they're gonna be upset you win send, Cliff. send the rating numbers from my special over to netflix <laughs> <laughs> okay ron i know i'm sending it right over to him but that's that's the bad side of the cycle i was talking about earlier we think everybody's thinking about us nobody's thinking about us nobody's thinking about anybody yeah at the end of the day you gotta realize it's all business and it's who they thought they would make the most money with yeah yeah, and then, you know, and if you piss off the wrong person, that'll haunt you. You know, the, the, the thing with that meeting, um, and over the years, it's kind of become a legendary story. I talked about it in one of my specials, um, but I, in my group anyway, and, and, you know, I took responsibility for it, I, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't swear at or anything. I just said no. <laughs> we're not doing what we're not doing what the network president tells us to do <laughs> not really the best idea <laughs> chris you have you have children right i do have two children two children how old are they uh, f uh 17 and f uh, gonna be 15 in may wow my son is about to be 16 right um so we're similar in there um 
How how autistic? He uh, classic autism. What he's had when he was diagnosed, he was diagnosed very early. Right. Fortunately, two years old. Um, so and he he was a moderate to severe at the time, but he's been in therapies since he was three. Um, now he's sixteen, about to be sixteen. He has a speech therapist. My favorite thing is him coming home from school and we're like, "How was your school? How was school?" He's like, uh, my day today was ninja. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fuck yeah, man. Hell yeah. I wish I had a ninja day. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. He's killing it. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about about uh, the difference in, in how you raised your children to, to your dad. And Well, my kids don't even talk to me right now. Mm. Yeah. That's what the new show is about. I, I, I got a Marigat and the one I'm writing about 30 minutes into it right now called, uh, it's called Stories I Shouldn't Tell. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and the reason I can tell him now is because everybody who the stories are about has died, so the lawyers won't be showing up, mm-hmm. which is good. So, uh, so it's my, when I was a kid, I left my dad and lived with my crazy mom after all this crazy had happened. But my dad beat on her so bad, talked so much shit about my mom. When I was like, I was like twelve, I just decided to, I, I ran away, and I, I didn't just run away. I got on an airplane, I hitchhiked to the air, San Jose Airport from uh, in the, from the Bay Area. Got on a plane and flew to L.A. That's that's and I was ten. Mm. Uh, no, I was, I, was, I was twelve actually, and, <laughs> and so I'll tell that story. But and then I lied about my dad in court. I lied about my dad in court, so I guess to live with my mom. And then when I lived with my mom, we actually uh, got evicted three times in two years. And I don't think a twelve-year-old should know the sheriff. No, <laughs> he'd be like, "How's it going, Doug? Do you want the furniture on the lawn now, or do you, can we wait till tomorrow?" Yeah. So that was Mike growing up. And these are stories I haven't told yet. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about my sister suicide too in it. And then, so then I went. Then my kids grew up, and I would, ne- you know, you swear I'm not gonna be my dad. Yeah. My kids went to private schools, and my psycho. I have a, I have a wife, ex wife that's who I've talked about many times. Who, in my opinion, is such a psychopath. And my son. And what happened was my son had been he'd been lying all year. He'd been four times he got busted for lying. His schoolwork was bad, and he doesn't have autism or anything. He's 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 just a very well taken care of rich kid <laughs> going to a private school. And so what happened was is that the fourth time he I caught him lying, we were going to I'm going to go snowboarding. I have a cabin in California. And we're going snowboarding, and I, I said, uh, "All right, man, I'm going to go to. The, I'm going with your school today. We're going to talk to your teachers. I'm going to get you out of school three days early to go snowboarding." Now he should have reacted like, "Woohoo!" Right? He got tense. He got like, "Uh, what?" I go, "Yeah, I'm going to talk to all your teachers. Make sure we get all your homework. I'm going to make sure I clear it with them." And it was like a surprise te- parent teacher conference. Like it was, a, it was literally like a Navy SEAL parent teacher conference where he didn't know it was going to come. He couldn't prepare for it. And I went to every teacher, and every teacher told me he was screwing up in school. He he was, wouldn't follow directions. His grades were bad. He's gone all the time. And I go, he's gone all the time. Like, what's that? Like, I had him 50-50 custody. So, and here's the, so I, I walked to the car. He'd already been in trouble four times this year for this. I'd taken him out of soccer because of it, because he'd been lying and messing up schoolwork. And I decided on the way to the car, what would my dad do? You should never ask, if your parents were screwed up, don't ask yourself whatever you, the answer to that question is the go opposite. the opposite <laughs> <laughs> i didn't I, I got in the car and i just i hadn't tried it. the only thing i hadn't tried on him was scaring him so i turned on him and i'm an actor and i just i just went he's 13 at the time i just went off on him i went off on him like i never have i was like you, you little bit and i just i swore at him and uh i took him some glasses off and i threw him on the dash and they broke and i, I thought god that's 300 bucks and yeah <laughs> i was so mad and he got yelled at. So we, by the time we got home, he was just he was just shaking. And get to my house, and and uh, I got him a tutor for math because we were still going snowboarding. And and I went to his bedroom at nine o'clock, and I said, "Hey, I want you to know I apologize for yelling like I did, but I said I wanted to wake you up to the fact that the world is not going to carry you." So we went. He said, "Okay," and I apologized to him. Went up to the cabin and uh, spent a week where I kind of manned him up. I gave him a lecture about manning up. And we got home on Easter, and the next week we were in court. Uh, I got. A, I was on the road, and I got. A, I got in my email. I got a fifty-page uh, court filing that said I had abused him, mm. and, and it should, that my ex-wife had filed. Uh, and then he. Then and then both my kids lied to child services, just like I did, because my dad told me when I was sick. When I came back to my dad after mom, we got evicted so many times. I moved back to my dad's. He said, "I hope your kids do this shit to you," and they did. <laughs> he was a warlock. <laughs> my dad was a warlock. So that's what the new show is about. It's like going through this thing because we all live in tragedy. The new show, like again, I always pick what it's about. We all live in tragedy. Tragedy is average. Mm-hmm. You know, um, everybody has someone dies, your family dies. 
tragedy is average. We're all going to have it. It's what you do between tragedies. Your entire life is made up of what you did between tragedies. No one is known for their tragedies. They're all known for what they did between them. The tragedies just amplify how good the between. So that's what the next mm. show is about. And it's all this circle about me losing my kids. So it's been, it's been rough. It's been rough. But my wife, my new wife said something awesome. She said, uh, by the way, uh, they're teenagers. They're dickheads right now. We don't have to raise them. That's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's kind of a valid And times point. changed. And, yeah. and that's true. That's a, I mean, my main issue a lot of time he, with, with my he, son. He is got the, yelled at one time in 10 years, though. That's the crazy thing. And then we found out that his mom was taking, the reason his grades are bad is on my weeks of custody, his mom was taking him out of school. Mm. And she was signing him out, going, doing something for two, three hours with him, and then bringing him to school. He wasn't, he wasn't learning. He was, yeah. She was taking him out. Yeah, yeah. Um, we sound like we got similar backgrounds. Uh, <laughs> do you have an ex like this? Yeah. Uh, I have an ex like that? Yeah. Well, we, I, we ha- I have soul custody. Uh, if that tells you anything. Yeah, that tells me a lot about her. <laughs> <laughs> In she California? Could, yeah. Oh, shit. That tells me a lot about she her. She didn't even put up the fight. Like, Oh, wow. You know, she's wow. that far gone about it. God, and, good for you, man. God bless. Good, good for you. Yeah. The reason, I mean, when the parts of my show and the premises of my show is a real life situation i had when i went to i was working on a show here and you know i wouldn't be working on a show in the show let's just tell you the real life situation right. i was working on a show um they a sitcom i was on called undateable right. and they were changing the work schedule up and at the time my my son I had joint custody i would go and visit my son a lot and he would stay with me in the summers and stuff yep. and um i would go visit him once a month right. and w- because of the work schedule it was going to be like, oh, I can't go see him for about three months. Right. And so I'm like, I, but I can go. I have next week off. So I can go next week and see him right. and, and set it up. And so I call him my ex and I'm like, okay, I, I know we don't normally do this, but can I have this week with him? I'm going to come out there and I'm going to come pick him up. I'm going to take him to a hotel. We'll just hang out, have a dad son weekend. Right. Awesome. You know? And I get, and um, she says, yeah, I, um, I don't care, hear from her for about another week up until Sorry. I go to pick him up. I go to pick him up and I'm going to call her to pick him up and she's not answering and she's not responding which is not out of the normal for me this had become a routine of being like she's, she'll say yes when i get ready to show up she'll act like he that they'll not be there just to freak me out make me feel shitty yeah, yeah, and yeah. then i'll take him for the weekend yeah. and then i go to pick him up for the weekend and their stuff is all strewn out on the yard and they're getting evicted <laughs> and like she, hey it's doug again how's it going doug <laughs> <laughs> oh wait wait a minute you went to pick your son up to get to vis- visitation, and mom was getting evicted at the time. Getting evicted. Wow. And I was, and I'm like, "What are you guys gonna do?" And she's like, "Well, I'm gonna go find an extended stay hotel, and um, I get my, you know, my son. Not only my son, but my son, autism. He's loud. He makes noises. I was yeah. like, he, he, you can't take him there. And first of all, I don't want my son there. Right. So I just was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take him back to L.A. with me, um, until you, you, you figure this out. Maybe. And and then we'll talk it. We'll talk about it later. And I got him back to L.A. and I called my lawyers, told them what was up. It took fucking years yeah. and three different court dates because and, and probably two houses of money. <laughs> yeah, two houses of, of, money. The, of me trying to convince them that I should have custody of my son yeah. because they're like you're you're traveling. You're you're a guy first of all, right? And if you have a penis for some reason, you can't raise a kid. And and the weird thing is. We're in 2019 now, and there is definitely a... And I, by the way, I'm married to an amazing woman. Her father's a Marine. And they were still like, yeah, that's your new wife. But yeah, but it's their, if, they, if they're 14, they can decide what they want to do. And if you're getting... So what happened? So you got him back. So, so what finally happened? I got him happened? with me. He's been living with me ever since. I awesome. got his sole custody. She went off and moved to Las Vegas for some reason, which I never sounds good I think to me. a lot of first wives end up there. <laughs> 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 pa- either passing out flyers or being the girl on the flyers <laughs> <laughs> and you know he's been with me but that's been our issue now is that um because he has when he's here you know he has a speech therapy he has a school he has his after school activities and a lot of times he'll just be like i want to go live with mom where i don't where he doesn't have to do anything where he didn't when i got him and enrolled him in school i found out that he he had not been enrolled in school for that year he hadn't been going to school for months. Well, here's the problem with me, because again, I have again, you're 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 such a nicer guy than him. I get it. 
So here's what happened in the court the last time, like, and, the, and the judge said, "I admit it. I'm like, I, I swore at him. Yeah, I swore at him. I go, this is ridiculous. I go, we went snowboarding that weekend. We had an awesome weekend. But his mom is crazy. His mom, so and 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 even the child services, is like, I go, guy, this none of this happened. She says happened. You know, well, your son says you were mean to him. I go, I yelled at him. I go, he'd been lying for three. So we get done with it, and this the judge actually got taken off the bench. This judge that actually made the decision on me doesn't isn't isn't family law. Did you go to downtown L.A.? Oh, this is in Oregon. Oregon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even Oregon was tough on you, huh? Mm-hmm. Man, a very mm, ultra liberal. Makes California look like we're kind of right wing. So uh, what happened was is that the, the, at the end, the judge goes, well, it's Titus. Well, you know, none of this stuff is substantiated except for you admitted to verbally abuse him. I go, I yelled at him one time in a decade. I once. He got yelled at one time. And the judge goes, well, Miss Titus, you admitted to it. So we're going to let him go to the mom. And I said, okay. I said, Your Honor, can I say something on record before I leave? And if I ever say that again and we're in a room together, I want you to grab me and yank me. Just grab me and take me out of the room. I can tell from yeah. you even that yeah. up. Like, maybe you want to say it off the record. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I turn to the judge and I go, this is the last time I'm going to be in this courtroom. I spent so much money uh, on fighting. And I offered her half of everything. And she said, no, she wanted more. And I didn't have it at the time. I was like, I don't ha- I, you, what are you talking about? And so uh, I said, Your Honor, I said, I said, uh, I said, first of all, I go, this court is ridiculous. I go, I go, this child got yelled at one time in a decade. I'm a good father, and he's got an amazing stepmother. And I go, but you? And I'd, I'd research this judge. I go, you're a real estate attorney. You don't know anything about family law. I've been in this business. I've been in this courtroom for 12 years. I know more about this than you do. And I go, I go you're ridiculous. I go, and this is a clown show. Thank you, Your Honor. And the judge looked at me and he had this look on his face like, hmm, I guess I could put him in jail right now <laughs> or I could just move on. And he said, thank you. Uh, there's an epilogue to it, though. We went back. We went back. She took me back for more child support and she had forged her taxes and we had pointed out to the first judge and he was like, Your Honor, I don't, you know, I don't care about the mistreatment. This is all about you. Well, this new, we went back and I was like, oh, and the bailiff, the bailiff, this, you know, the weird part about this, do you have, did you have like a, did you have the same people in your courtroom or was it different all the time? No, the same. Okay. This one bailiff is the only cat that has been through my entire case from for 12 years. We've had five different judges. We've had, or six different judges. We've had different, uh, uh, different, like, like the people that write on the thing that, the, 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 stenographers. the stenographers, this one bailiff has been in every court thing I've been in. So he knows more about my case than any of these judges. And I walk into this final day and I know I had just told this judge to, to suck it. I basically get told this judge to suck it. And the, and, and the bailiff walks over to me and I'm signing in and he goes, he goes, hey man. And I go, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> and he go, hey, hey, I go, this ain't gonna go good. And he looks me right in there and he goes, just be you. And the new judge comes out, another guy comes out and he reamed my ex for her. She faked her taxes and then he told her, he said, if you bring him back, he points to me, he goes, if you bring him back here one more time, it's gonna cost you. And I was like, what just happened? You know, but my kids and I, you know, it'll work out. It'll right, it'll work out, right? I think it'll right? work out. Right, it'll work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, ages change, they learn, they go like, you know, things will be fun. That's what I always, that's what my mom fun. told me was like, he thinks his mom is fun now because he can't, because she yeah. won't let him do things, but you looking out for him, he'll he'll respect later. And uh, and I hope that's true. Well, my, I, I, I've checked my daughter's Instagram once in a while. She's wilding. I'm like, mm. oh, shit, here we go. Mm. Here we go. But, you know, this has been a very serious podcast. We've been very serious. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, we don't do much ha-has. <laughs> oh, good. No, I didn't know. Okay, so is it normal like this? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. I didn't know that. I, I just, I didn't want, I don't, let's just we take it down. Hey, it's I Titus and Titus and Funch is bringing it down. We're just going to bring it down, get sealed. Let's, yeah, to the, let's dig into the real a little bit. For real. Um, I, mean, we went so, all, I didn't even have notes for this. Next time you go write a, a show, man. Again, again, there's a point you learn that thing where you try to you try to give them what they want on writing a show, and 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 that one point you didn't get that far because if if they knew what they wanted, they would tell someone to write it. Mm. They don't know. They do not know. Everything's a fluke. HBO turned down Breaking Bad. HBO said, "Fuck no, hell no." HBO. 
One of the biggest shows of all time. There's, I mean, you know, the people that turned down Titus, NBC turned down Titus. Titus, the box set for the third season of Titus goes for 200 bucks right now. And I was like, knock on wood, I didn't end up in a discount bin. That's right. <laughs> Woo! I'm not in the discount Classic. bin. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, and so you, you just, if any, if someone else said that, nobody in show business knows anything. It's so true. And you have to remember that when you're in there. Yeah. They like you because of you. Here's what I do. If you want that, let's do that. If not, Okay, but do I'm me a keep favor. Doing what I do. Yeah, but do me a favor. Don't hire me for me, and then make me not me. Mm. <laughs> if people yeah. could just, and that's again, the, the people I love the most in, in show business are the ones that go, no, nah, no, nah, we hired you for you. Do everything the best way you can do you, and then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. Don't and, don't get me and then mute what makes my my best quality. Right. Well, then you get to walk away clean though. See, the problem is like with that meeting I said, and probably at that show the first time when you changed it for him and it didn't go. Didn't you hate yourself? Weren't you mad? Weren't you like that you changed it? Up? Well, I just knew what I was just write these things at the at the end of when I was writing what I liked at the end of it. Even there's always that pressure and all the like, oh, it's not fucking working. Right. And then you like at the end of the day, you're like, fuck, we did it. And with this show, even when that we were done, it was it was just like, all right, well, we did it. <laughs> we knocked. Yeah, it. you weren't happy. Yeah, you grew a tumor on your soul. And by the way, here's the thing. Here's here's you. Here's death. It's going like it's it's coming. It's coming. Why would you waste any moments in between there dealing with dealing with some guy? I can, you want to hear a, you want to hear a network story? Yeah. All right. Here's a network story. This is a fun one. Uh, so we're on the show with Titus, and and we've been we're doing crazy stuff. We did an episode where we we had an intervention to get my dad to drink again, like, <laughs> and we're pitching this stuff to the network. Uh, episode four, we cheated on each other, and then and had to fight that out. Had that because everybody had everybody had real people have those fights. And, uh, and the network would just see every time we'd pitch an episode, they were like, oh, my God. Uh, we did an episode where uh, my mom, <laughs> where my mom actually shot her husband. We did all kinds of crazy. She really did, by the way. My mom actually shot and killed her last husband. Uh, uh, the joke I used to, I say last husband because you don't get another one after that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we did all these crazy episodes. And so we did an episode where my dad was in. I, I, this is a true story. There was a gig that, that, at Paradise in uh, by the Bahamas that used to be. Did you ever work that gig? Did you ever do mm -hmm. that gig? Okay, so you go down and you do this casino uh, in the Bahamas, and it was fun. My dad loved to gamble. I knew they had gambling. I said, Dad, why don't you go with me? Because he had already had three or four heart attacks. It was, you know, I knew the end. The end could be at any minute. So I said, All right. And he was he's still he was still pretty robust for, for a guy who had four heart attacks. Um, uh, but he so we go to the, there, and, and what happened was. He didn't hang out with me at all. He gambled the whole time. <laughs> and I called my wife at the time. I was like, hey, he won't even, he won't even, I brought him here to hang out. It's father's son. And he won't hang out. She goes, go, go gamble with him. I sit down at the table with my father. I gamble. We, we play three hands. He loses three hands, turns to me and goes, you're bad luck. Get the fuck away from me. So I, I, I burst out laughing and I went and sat with these other people. We played and we, we won a little bit of money. My dad shows up like an hour later and I'm like, you lost everything, didn't you? And the man pulls out a wad from his pocket. Like he goes, no, I made ninety five hundred bucks. Damn. So that's the true story. So when we did the show, I wrote, we wrote an episode like that where we go to the Bahamas and the whole crew goes down to hang out to become, you know, to to, to bond the family together. And Dad just plays, just gambles. So he just keeps playing cards. So I sit next to him, he tells me to leave, and all of a sudden he gets on a streak and he starts winning. We start to have the the story is the script he wrote. He's having a heart attack at the table. Mm -hmm. He starts to have a heart attack but he's on a streak so he won't leave. So at one point, Keech is so funny, his left side's going numb and he's not playing, he's playing it like his side's dying and he's still he's still trying to put cards down, he's lifting his hands up, it was, Keech was hilarious. <laughs> in, this, in the show, Keech has a heart attack at the blackjack table, falls off the thing and dies, he dies. And then we cut to, he, we go and in and we, we're in the we're in we're going through space and time and we show up at the pearly gates of heaven and as Keith shows up to the pearly gates of heaven they turn the lights off and they're like and we're like Shh, Nobody we're here. Home. nobody's home we're out we're closed and so Keith is banging on the gates of heaven and he's screaming and you hear someone go someone you hear a piano go bong and someone goes Jesus sorry like it's like it's it's all this stuff that we shouldn't be doing it's wrong so I know at network notes, and you've had notes with people, and 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 there's people you love to hear notes from, and there's people when they start talking, you're like, hey, you just have to focus. You have to get your face, lock your face, so you don't show any emotion. And this one guy goes, you go, this guy who we hate, oh, this guy. Every we we. We'd take notes, then all the writers, we'd go up in the room, and then we'd rip on this guy for an hour and a half. That's and Before we could, we couldn't know, no one could write until they got all their hatred yeah, for this dude I've out. Been there, hey. You know this guy, okay. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it, so 
He turns and he goes, and we're waiting. I'm waiting. I, I know we're getting this entire scene cut. A, we can't kill a main character because we brought him back at the end, but we can't kill a main character. B, we did all this religious imagery. C, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for this long lecture on what we can do. And the guy goes, it's in the Bahamas, right? And you know, Cynthia Watcher is super hot. And he goes, uh, so it's in the Bahamas. And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, so listen, uh, Cynthia is going to be in a bikini, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, we're going to put a wrap around her lower part, you know, but, but yeah, she'll be in a bikini. He goes, here's what I'm going to need. I'm going to need to see... We want to go as far as standards of lettuce with Cynthia, so why don't you make sure I get to see the bikini, um, so we can so I can pass it by standards because we want to get as small as the bikini as we can, and we're all sit- all the writers we're all sitting there and and like and I'm wait and and I, and I said is that your note and he goes yeah funny episode, <laughs> and then the next thing something tiny would blow the entire script out and yet they let us do all this religious stuff and say Jesus and, and I was just the oh, weirdest he got his private bikini pic yeah and all he wanted was I don't know what he wanted to do with the bikini make sure you send it over to my office so I can make sure it's the right really is that what you want bro <laughs> so Hollywood's crazy and the reason I do it myself is because we did the movie Special Unit it took me 10 years to get Special Unit made and it's about due to the Fairness and Disabilities Act, the LAPD has to hire four handicapped undercover detectives. And we had we we hired disabled actors with autism. We hired uh, we hired disabled actors uh, like quadriplegics, and we put them in the movie because no one does that. Well, the reason no one does that because Hollywood is kind of a ballist group of humps that won't do it. They think there's going to be a problem. People don't want to see it. Mm-hmm. So we got three investors, myself and two other guys, and and. Uh, and we made the movie, man. And Peter Farrelly out of the blue called me. That's when people are mad. Are you mad about Green Book? Are you mad that he won for Green Book? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> you and I need to hang out more because I'm the same way. Do you watch the Oscars? Nope. <laughs> I don't really give a shit. Um, so they're mad at him. But Peter Farrelly is such a good dude. He called me out of the blue. Jackie Flynn knows him. I don't know Peter Farrelly. And he said, hey, I hear you writing this group with disabled people in it. We put a lot of disabled people in our, in our, in a fairly movie. And he goes, uh, he goes, we got, we got it wrong with the ringer. And mm. Jackie Flynn, who's in the movie, he knows me. And he goes, he said, you're getting it right. Can I read the script? And I said, I'm fine. It's such a weird phone call, dude. It's such a weird, sometimes magic happens too. Um, cause not everyone in Hollywood's a dick. Some of them are awesome people. So I've sent Peter Farley a script. He reads the script. He goes, calls me back and he goes, can I give you notes? And I said, Peter Farrelly. Now, remember all that shit I said about, have you written a script? Have you been funny before? Peter Farrelly calls you, go, oh yeah, please God, thank you. And guess what? I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. Do you know why? Because you're Peter fucking Farrelly. That's why. <laughs> so he uh, calls me back with notes and he, and he blowtorched it. He blowtorched the script. And he said it was funny, but then he started, he started doing stuff. I've written long enough to know when, you ever hear, some, you ever hear a note from something you wrote? That, that it is so true and so dead on that you hate yourself for missing it. Mm-hmm. The script is very kind of Austin Powersy, and he goes, <laughs> Peter Farrelly goes, uh, so you got this, I, because I, I, what I wanted to do is I want to put as many disabled people in this movie as possible. Didn't make d- disabled actors in this movie. Give them a shot. And so all the criminals were disabled too. And the cops were disabled and the criminals were disabled. And Peter Farrelly goes, so you're trying to say that disabled people are, uh, are capable of doing anything normal cops can do. And I go, yeah. And he goes, then how come they can only take down disabled criminals? Mm. And so I want you to know in the movie, uh, when you see the able-bodied actors uh, as the criminals, uh, those were going to be cast as disabled people, and it's Peter Farrelly's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but they, and so he was right. It was, and I had to rewrite. We were about five weeks from production from filming, and I had to stop everything, and I had to rewrite the entire script. 63 pages. That one change killed 63 pages. I did, and it, uh, so, but without it, the movie would have been this goofy, kind of lame Austin Powersy thing. Instead, it grounded in the reality of what I had yeah. to write. And with um, without that change, you can you can find a viewpoint where it's kind of mo- mocking. Right, right, right. Well, my character, the, my character is such an asshole. Disabled people. I mean, your son. You see it with your son sometimes, right? Is it is it evident your son's autistic, or is it just after you get around him? Um, it, it really depends on how much time you spend with him right. and what he's doing at right. the time. Right, that's the thing. Um, that's really so interesting about it, and one of the reasons why I wanted to write about it is that we get in all these little misunderstandings because people can't tell. Right, they they just think he's being bad or he's doing something right. or he's just yelling, hooing for some reason. And they look at you. What a bad parent you are. Yeah, can you, can you control your kid? Yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> he's autistic no. yeah why is he saying god damn it all the time because i'm just happy he's fucking talking 
hey, he was nonverbal for three years. Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. I got him a Richard Pryor album. I don't know. It opened him up. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he would get real into the weirdest things. I remember when I was like, you were my son. Was, he was like three years old. And I was like, what do you, what do you want to watch? I'm assuming it's Aladdin. It's, it's something like that. And he was like, mm, Larry Sanders show. <laughs> and I was like, Holy shit. Wow. You are a cool kid. You're not autistic. You're a genius. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Well, so so disabled people I found that get treated three different ways. I got a lot of friends who are disabled. They get they get ignored, which is the worst. Because then they can't even react if you're shitty to them. Then they get made fun of to their face or they get made a flat behind their back. Mm -hmm. That's what I find the three. And uh and the worst thing for my buddy Mike was being ignored. Mike's crazy. Michael Ronan, he's he's a comic and a public speaker. This was always funny. Some someone's disabled. Michael Ronan, public speaker, stand-up comedian, and he works for ICE. He works he works for the government. This motherfucker's got three jobs. Disabled? <laughs> are you you got three jobs? That's not that's exceptional. I, I, Jamaican. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we we wrote the movie and and Mike was in it and anyway and it's. No, but no studio would have the balls to do it. They just they were like, yeah, this is really funny, but we don't know how this is gonna land. And, and then you see, you know, then you see any of these movies that come out and they use able bodies actors. They won't get so much shit, and it's like, we, why won't you guys just mine the publicity of something good like that? But again, it comes down to people who don't know what works, making decisions on what they think works, mm -hmm. and then when they do find something that works. Then they, they want to re. Can I get that again? <laughs> yeah, please? Ex exactly. Over and over, when they don't know the 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 constant, at least for me, from an else from a person who's a study of comedy and a study of, of television, the thing that usually works is when people introduce you to authentic, unique worlds. Right. And I think that's what worked about your show. That same thing that worked about Seinfeld. Yep. It's completely different shows, but because they were authentic, unique to that person's point of view, and they were real to that point of breaking view, they bad, worked. Man, breaking, yeah. Again, breaking bad i think it's one of those things that it, it, you got you got you got seinfeld too you got you got sucked in you were like you were in and we have so many things that are just the same rehash of the same we've had some great comedians and here's the thing we've had some killer comics guys that are famous now that are awesome that had their shot and listened to the executives and they their shot got ended you know they had their shot they got the show on the air and it died because and I watch those shows because I every time I see someone I I, I think it's really funny and, I, and again I have I, I love anybody who has the balls to get on the stage. I'll see a comic who I know is act, see his TV show, and be like, "What the fuck did they do to him? Mm. Why did they do this?" And then the show dies after a year or it makes two seasons and then it goes away. And it's because yeah, it's weird. It's such a weird balance. I don't have. I don't think I have the diplomacy to deal with it. So that's why I do my own stuff. Back to your first question four hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't remind me. Halston, where are we? I assume we're in overtime. Oh, yeah, overtime. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. But I mean, I mean, I could talk to you forever. I hope we can we can talk more even off off mic. Well, the so problem is I talk forever. That's the problem. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I don't care. I'm a good listener. Yeah. So, but we'll, we'll end it. Something. Yeah, no, please no. ask me a question. I want to ask you. I want to ask you about your special. How was please. this last special you shot? How was it? And how long did it take you to? You know, I saw the special. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. But how how did you feel about? the way you were dealt with and how you got, how you felt with it. I mean, how did you, how did you feel? I felt, I felt really good with it at the end. Um, the whole process was that, you know, I just wanted to pitch a special and in my mind's eye, I wanted to, wanted to go to Netflix and wanted to be like a worldwide distribution right. and good check and everybody's happy. And then, um, they, I had meetings with them. I went to Montreal and then pitched my hour to, to HBO and, um, and Comedy Central and Netflix and Netflix got back to me and they were like, we don't, we don't see you as an hour comedian. We would like you to come in and do a half hour if you want. And, uh, but we don't, we don't personally at this time, the way that we're, we're structuring our, our, our programming, we don't see you as an hour comedian. But, and then there, but to me, that's just a difference in opinion and you not knowing my skill set. But what they really made me angry was then they started to try to sell me on the fact that an hour didn't mean anything anymore. That it was just a older ideal that I was holding on to and that people were engaging more with these half hours and these 15s. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not a fucking idiot. What do you mean? You're telling me that I'm better off being in the middle of 630 minutes that you, just, that you put out at one time than having my own fucking special with my own name on it? 
it. Isn't it awesome when 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 some twenty five year old who doesn't oh, this would be clear doesn't know shit comes out and and they try to change a model that has worked for fifty years. I'm sorry, what? You <laughs> back to Red Skelton who had our specials. You're gonna at prior. You're gonna take something that's worked forever. We actually know how much time. Well, because of YouTube, people don't listen. Bullshit. If it's good, they'll listen. Exactly. If it's funny, they'll watch. Exactly. That's it. That's the bottom. Human beings haven't changed. Still DNA. It's the same shit happened until we grow another head or grow a screen or like uh, uh, just comes out of our forehead. We're we're good. We're fucking. It always pisses me off when people just grab it and they go, "Yeah, we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna just change the entire model." Yeah. yeah, you know it's gonna. Be, you know what's gonna be good for you. You're gonna be a barista now. In about two, <laughs> in about two years, you're gonna be a barista. Why? Because they're gonna go. Remember that guy that tried to change it, and make comedy 15 minutes. Hey, I get what happened. I don't know. I think I think he makes lattes now. <laughs> God damn. Yeah. It and then me and then to me that's a whole. It's a whole. It's it's a less model about specials. And to me, a special is someone when you like. I want to present you a full meal of comedy that I presented. Maybe it's taking me three years, two years, five narrative. years, ten years. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Narrative. But but I have this done, and my life has changed, and I'm moving on and to me now there's more of this assembly model of like let's just shoehorn everyone into the same lighting same stage same thing and i didn't want to do that so i, I and that's the company i said no to <laughs> 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 that's exactly uh, but the, here's the thing that's what we're going to do something I, I well combustion films if any comics out there that ever hear this and you tell people you guys want to shoot your special the way you want to shoot it um we can do it better than we can do it better and then i now i and i now have a distribution partner that we're going to take care of their comedy division and it'll be worldwide and here's the thing you're going to get big netflix money up front no but what you will get you will own your special you'll get 80 percent of the revenue they will put it on their, their, their around the world and it'll get it'll get made and in three years guess what it's yours again. If you're happy with the deal, there'll be another couple years. And if you're not, then you get your special back. And it's yours. You know why? Because it fucking should be. Yeah. You, 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 people don't even understand how hard it is to do comedy. I, I should shut up now because it's going on. But you fucking travel and you bleed and you work and you suck sometimes and some asshole yells shit at you one day and, and you have to deal with that dickhead and, and you deal with club owners and shitty green rooms and horrible hotels. And, and then someone goes, someone who's sitting in an office in LA who's making money off 100,000 comics or made 100 comics goes, yeah, yeah, no, we're going to own that now. No, you're not. Blow me. And that's, again, why I'm slowly getting taken out of show business. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's smart, and maybe I'll, 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 do it, I'll learn to do it that way without telling people, blow me, and they, they just won't know. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing about Hollywood. It does, if you know, it just means blow me. I can think everybody knows it. I just, I, I, I got I to gotta change my, my wife is trying to, I'll get better. I need, do you have a good therapist? Yeah, I okay, do. Good. <laughs> good. I, should great. Go see him. I should go see him and talk to him. I think they would just say, just don't talk a lot. <laughs> you don't have a therapist? <laughs> <laughs> That's the closer. That's yeah. <laughs> Except for I have to ask you one thing that because yep. we always do at the end of the show is and, and, um, just for a piece of advice thing on your mind. You've done so much already, but maybe if it's just something outside of comedy, something different that's just been on your mind, maybe a thing that you've gone through recently, just a piece of advice, just something you want to share with us. I know that is extremely vague. Everyone knows <laughs> it. And now go. Mm -hmm. Again, it's what I learned this last time. Tragedy will happen what are you doing now what you know and so many people ride their tragedy my my brother my brother who i love to death still talks about dad never went to my baseball games motherfucker you're 43 mm. you're 43 i was going to be a professional baseball player. no you weren't <laughs> no, you know and he's still you, you so you, tragedy happens now what mm. i think that's excellent advice yeah, yeah, that's, thanks, that's beautiful that's, that's exactly how i feel it's how you act in between how you how you handle it. It, yeah. it happens to all of us. Like you said, it's, it's the one true constant. Yeah, people and, get offended when I say tragedy is average. They're like, no, my mom died. Yeah, my, I know. What did you think? She was a vampire? Do you think she was going to make it? <laughs> 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 oh, man. Well, it, I knew I, um, it would be a pleasure talking with you. I've Thank always you. wanted to. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Now I want you're going to come do my podcast, right? Please, I'd love to. We actually, we do the Armageddon update and we talk about stuff. We bring whatever's going on in the world and then we beat on that. Okay. All right? Absolutely. All right, thank I you, I'd love man. to. Please, thank, thank you for taking the time. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Bye.